agenda. This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so we'll call the October 21st, 2020 meeting of the Board of Education Liaison Committee to order at 6.30 p.m. I'm Bill O'Brien, Ninth District Councilman and Chairman of this committee. And do we have a motion to approve the minutes of the September 15, 2020 meeting? I'll make a motion to accept the minutes with um, the changes suggested by Mrs. Mangini to reflect the correct amount of the CARES grants. That's I'll Allison Del Benny. Sorry. Do we have a second? A second. second. Karen Rodia. Any discussion? So that, that amount is 924,887. That's correct. In, instead of 190,000. Correct. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Passes unanimously. All right. Okay. COVID-19. Um, why, don't, why don't we skip that? Let that be part of Janet's report. Okay. That sound good? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then, current, and then current budget update. Uh, who Pam. do we go to for that? Pamela? Pam, Pam Mangini. We're happy to uh, update you. Um, obviously, we're still very closely monitoring our 2021 budget. And we are currently collecting deficits, special education, out of students. This will be discussed with the board at its meeting next week as we've just um, had a couple of additional outplay students over the past week. Um, and the board will also be taking action at the meeting on Monday evening to discuss the budget. At Pam, you're, you're cutting, you're cutting in and out. Pam, can you hear me? You're cutting in and out. I can, and actually, you were a little to me, so I don't know. Maybe oh, it's my connection. Is it any better now? Yes. Okay. It is. Um, also, can if you're not okay. talking, can can you go to uh, mute yourself? I can figure it out. Sure. Okay. I think you heard the part about our special education projected deficit. Um, and I started to note that the board is taking is going to be taking formal action on its at its meeting Monday evening to adjust its budget to the actual town appropriation without the carryover funds as an offset. This adjustment has created a need for a spending freeze district wide, which we implemented about a month ago, as we will have to reduce our budget by over $577,000. And we did discuss this a bit the last time we met when we talked about the non lapsing funds. Um, we're hoping that the town will work with us to offset some of these funds so we can at least restore instructional supply funding to our schools. And we're hopeful that the entire carryover balance for fiscal year 20 which is an unaudited, unaudited amount of 712,000 will be transferred to the non-lapsing account. The district has concerns with our special education budget, as I noted, as well as the instructional supplies that will have to decrease. And we do have a deficit that we need to address with our food service program. So that's the reason why we are hoping that we will um, have that dollar amount in our non-lapsing um, fund. And I have discussed these issues as along with a whole laundry list in a two hour meeting a couple of weeks ago with Don Savo and Chris Kamiak, and they've both been really great to work with. And they seem to imply that it's promising that we will be able to have those funds. And that's my report. Oh, sorry, I, was, I had forgot to unmute myself. Thanks, Pamela. Any, <laughs> any uh, questions? I, I just have a question, Pam, real quick, because I think uh, you were cutting out, and I I want to know what non-something funds you were referring to. What is what is that? We were talking about the non-lapsing fund, and non that is a, right. It's my understanding that um, a request will be coming before the town council if it has not already. Um, I've been working with Don and Chris, and. It is a fund that under state 
statute can be established and the town can appropriate up to 2% of our operating budget amount for the Board of Education to use solely for educational purposes. So the carryover money of 712,000, what is that gonna be used for? Our hope at this point, based on the language, the um, draft of the language that I saw for the non lapsing fund, it limits us to use it for special education um, deficits or offsets on the anticipated spending, technology, capital, non-recurring expenses. So you could use that for the special ed, right? Special ed, it would also allow us to use it for an unanticipated expense, such as the deficit in our food service um, program, along with our hope is that we'll be able to offset the funding that is in our current operating budget for technology by taking it out of the non-lapsing. As you may recall, we chatted briefly the last time about some miscommunication as to whether or not the board could have used the carryover to offset actual operating expenses. And it was determined that we could not, which kind of left us in a difficult position. And we're working through it, um, but the $200,000 in technology would being reinstated would be a tremendous benefit and help. So we could restore the 200,000 almost in instructional supplies that we've now frozen, to make certain we stay in the black. So, so the grants, the CARES grant that you got, that's not used for technology? It cannot for the, the normal technology. I'm talking about the general operating budget. And when yeah. we talk of grants, we have to be very careful that we never um, supplant the grants based on what was budgeted in our general operating budget. So the 577,000 has caused the, the uh, spending freeze. Correct. Correct, and then out of that 577, how much of that would be for um, special ed? At this point, I think we're confusing the issues. The 577,000 mm -hmm. is the dollar amount that the board would short. They approved a budget that was $577,000 over the town appropriation for fiscal year 21. They had hoped to utilize some funds from the carryover. And at that point, our carryover, we did not know exactly what that amount would be. And we assumed it would be around a half million dollars, the 600,000. It did come to a little bit more. And again, that's pending the final audit amount. Okay. So special ed is something completely different. The special ed projected deficit just occurred in the past week, happens quite frequently in all districts. Um, we estimate what our out of district placements would be and the cost have exceeded our budget already and we're only in third, fourth month of school. And then the food service deficit, um, can can that carryover money be used to supplement, to uh, carry over fees for that? That would be a perfectly appropriate use of it. And mm -hmm. that deficit in the program has been going on from, it's my understanding for many years, and it's been in the town's audit for years. Mm -hmm. um, so I know everybody's aware of it, it's been problematic. And we are working um, very diligently to try to come up with a plan so that we can eliminate the deficit going forward. And um, where in the process is the audit? I believe, I know that the auditors are in our office this week and next week. I don't know where they are with the town. It's really the town's audit. We're just the department of the town that gets audited as well. Right, they're doing the Board of Ed and the town. Correct. So they haven't started with the Board of Ed or they're doing them simultaneously? They do them at the same time and they send auditors out to both. They started months ago just pulling some information doing their preliminary work, and now they're coming back to do additional work. By so what, state, I'm what, sorry, but by state statute and OPM, they have to be completed by December 31st. Okay, yeah, no, no that's good. Um, so out of this shortfall, how much of that is food services? 
it's um, not in that amount. What I'm hoping is out of the 712,000 that we're now projecting as a carryover, right. that we could utilize 200,000 of it for offset to our current operating budget for technology. And then we would go to the next step, which would be to cover any special education deficits if we have them and we can't um, absorb that through our operating budget. Next, any balance I would like to apply to the food service deficit, which right now is somewhere around a half million dollars. Okay, so that's the plan for the carryover money. Correct. That's the plan for the carryover money. All right, well, that, that sounds like um, that's that's doable. And then what would it take to alleviate the spending freeze? The $200,000 um, commitment from the town that we could put that, we can offset our current technology expenses that we already paid out of the current operating budget, expense it to the non-lapsing fund once it's established. Um, that would free up that amount of money in our operating budget, and then we could um, eliminate the spending freeze. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any questions on that, but um, I think I'm a little more clear on this. Um, so I just okay, had a uh, question. Oh. Was that Allison? It is. Greg, did you want to go ahead? Um, no, I'll, I'll pause. Mine isn't directly for Pam. It's just more about um, the audit that's happening. When I had spoken to Janet, maybe last week or the week before, um, we had asked for an update on the audit, and she said since it is the town's audit, we technically can't get an update until it's complete. So I didn't know if we were able to um, request updates throughout or just, you know, she said we would have to request it from the town side to get any updates on how it's going. Which budget or which audit are you referring to, Allison? We have the regular annual audit going on right now, and we also just scheduled um, meetings with the auditors for the financial controls audit. The, <laughs> um, <No>. I, <laughs> Let when me, I was speaking maybe. with Janet, she didn't specify which one. We were just kind of calling okay. it the audit. So the one that um, the town that's going on for both the town and the Board of Ed, was my okay. understanding. Actually, they both are, but my guess is you're probably referring to this um, out of ordinary audit. Correct, not the, not the okay. typical one. Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And um, as far as any updates, I would say we could probably ask, but I don't really think they have much to report yet. Um, we literally just today confirmed um, appointment times. The auditor has asked to meet with probably 10 of us um, in the Board of Ed District office to review processes. And those are scheduled for early November. So perhaps sometime in mid to late November, maybe we can get some kind of um, summary or update at that point. Okay, great. Just because I know board members um, have been asking and I ha we haven't been able to give them any information. So. Great. Okay. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, You're Pam. Welcome. Greg, You're you have some, Greg, you had a question? Um, yes, thank you, Bill. Uh, it's a general question for anybody, I guess. Um, thinking that, you know, we're, I forget the phrase, you know, half the kids are home half the time and Wednesdays are free and maybe a lot of kids are full time at home. I was thinking of the food services maybe food services should be a lower cost because they're serving fewer meals and fewer kids may be eating. I don't know how reduced and free lunches work in that matrix, but in general, um, what areas of cost, uh, I hate to use this word, uh, are avoided be because more kids are at home or is it really that there's more more costs, not avoided costs, because of the dynamic? Actually, the um, current operation of our food service is running under something the USDA terms the summer seamless option. And as a result, all students, um, K through 12, 
are entitled to a free breakfast and lunch at the current time. So we are reimbursed a set amount for every single meal, full meal that we serve. The issue right now, surprisingly, is that a lot of our students are not taking advantage of these free lunches. So we are sending out um, email blasts and doing whatever we can to try to um, encourage them to take these free lunches and our costs our labor at the moment. So we are working with Sodexo. They have laid off a number of their staff and they continue to try to um, diminish the number of labor hours in any areas that they possibly can. So unfortunately, I thought this free lunch period would probably at least let us break even. And until we can get students to take better advantage of the free lunches, um, and even the distance learners, we're finding that people are not returning um, that much. Parents are not and families are not to pick up these free lunches. So we are starting at the high school where we're actually sending students home with the lunch for the next day um, on Tuesdays when they won't be there on Wednesdays. And we're going to see how that works. And if it does, we did get permission from the state. It's perfectly appropriate to do. Uh, we will try to um, continue that through all the grades. So nothing's a simple answer, and I apologize for that. No. Are there other general areas that have added cost or reduced costs? You know, maybe transportation's higher because of X, and maybe something else is lower. I was just trying to think in, at a high level some of the financial dynamics of the challenges that you guys are facing. It changes, I think, on a daily basis, but right now what I'm presenting to the board does, in fact, provide for some areas that we anticipate savings, and we do have some savings with bus transportation because we aren't having a full complement of buses on Wednesdays. Um, and there are some areas that we're anticipating savings, such as um, sporting events. I, we do not collectively believe that we will have as many sporting events as were initially planned. Um, we are assessing all the various stipends that employees receive, and there are some that you know, programs won't run. There's some savings there. And that's, that's basically what we do on at least a weekly, if not almost a daily basis, is reassess. And unfortunately, there's so many variables right now. Um, and the rules really are changing daily. So we are constantly looking at um, areas of savings as well as where our budget may overrun. Um, in the past, with this kind of circumstance, we would have savings also with substitute teachers. And while we are struggling to get subs, we're really not quite sure yet what those savings will look like. So we are monitoring it very carefully, but I understand that the really good point is looking at everything from a high level and what we're trying to do, but oftentimes we also need to get into the weeds to see exactly where our budget is heading. Yeah. Um, thank you for that overview. Thanks, Pam. That answered some of my questions too. I want to mention okay. I just read a legal notice today that Stratford will be getting another three hundred eight thousand five hundred twenty-six dollars in CBDG money. Can the Board of Ed apply for some of that? That is usually collaboratively with the town. So I will um, actually bring that up to um, Dr. Gaeta as well as um, Dr. Robinson to follow up on as well with the town. Um, but we usually have to apply for that together. Thank you. Um, why don't we go on to the superintendent's report? Hi, Bill. Nice to see you. Nice Janet. to talk to you again. Um, Bill, I, most of my report is focused on our current situation. Um, as, um, as you know, we have um, different in the state of Connecticut, we have um, a color-coded chart that um, uh, places towns depending on their um, infection rate. Currently, and this may change in the next week or so, but currently we are um, we are really below the first ranking, which is a yellow yellow orange and red. Um, several towns in um, Fairfield Town County just in the last few days have gone into the red. Um, we've been 
off the chart on the left, which is below the yellow, that means less than five cases. Um, obviously, that that's that's moving, that's changing. So that allows us to have more flexibility in terms of what we may may do with with our our students. We are in the hybrid model as we talked about last time, and um, the hybrid model is actually would be the middle of that chart. If uh, it, but we are using that just for the sake of um, safety and confidence. And we feel very confident that we are um, at a point where we can move our um, elementary students back in, those that wish to come back in. And that's quite a, there's quite a number of those. Um, we have all the mitigations in place. Uh, yesterday at our call with DPH, which we have every Tuesday morning that with DP, state DPH with our uh, health department and the superintendent, um, statement was made that the safest place for children to be is in school because school is the one and only place all the mitigations are in place and so it's um it's our desire and we will be discussing this at the board meeting next monday night to begin to move students um, gradually back into school the elementary students um, so far we have uh, eight adults who have tested positive and I'm not quite sure if there's one more, but there have been four students. Not one of those has contracted it at school. Um, it has been places and things they've done outside of school, um, and a couple weren't were on um, out on distance learning and contracted it. So we're we're optimistic that we will be able to bring elementary in. My greatest concern is going to be after Thanksgiving as we anticipate that many families will have their traditional Thanksgivings. Um, and we've already seen, we have, um, we have several that have gotten ill because of family gatherings, small family gatherings, but nonetheless, they, they have had an outcome of, of illness. The other thing that's happening with Thanksgiving is college students who are away at school, most of the schools will be closing down. So they will be home from Thanksgiving through the first of the year. Um, what that means is, um, Try to keep college students at home. It doesn't work very well. And they have friends that they here in Stratford, they'll want to see their high school friends. And my concern is, is the gatherings of college students that may introduce this into the community. So we're uh, we are trying to move and keep keep a, I'd like to just have a bu bubble over my kids, but we will do the best we can with that. So that's what we're spending a lot of time dealing with our issues around it. Um, I would have to tell you. I've sung their praises before, but I will continue to say this. The um, support that we've had from our Stratford Public Health Department has been remarkable. They have been very, very helpful, and we, we do appreciate that. Uh, that's the, the bulk of what we're dealing with. We are trying to get as much, as much um, normalcy for kids as we can and still keep them safe. Uh, CIAC has sent out a possible schedule for resumption of some winter sports. And so we're having discussions about how those uh, sports need to be mitigated to keep them safe. So every day we're dealing with some safety factor in that respect. And that's, that's my life. You can tell, you can tell me no one well, I guess the first thing I'll ask, since you mentioned uh, winter athletics, how does it look for youth basketball getting the use of the gyms? I know it's been discussed at Sterling House at the rec department, and uh, it's going to be a tough call, I think. Well, I know I received um, I received their their request and and the locations, but no one has really spoken to me about what the mitigations will be, um, and how they're going to clean afterwards and so forth. So there's some there need to be some discussions about that. Because obviously we we don't want people coming in and then having those areas not being cleaned before kids are back in the building the next day, kids and staff. So it sounds like those using the gyms would be responsible for the cleanup afterwards. Yes, and touch surfaces from wherever they enter through to the gym. You know, frankly, Bill, I have a lot of concerns about basketball. Yeah. I really do. Uh, you know, it's pretty pretty clear that wrestling is is a no go, uh, but basketball people really you know there's want to play, but even in the professional sports when they're in a bubble they're they're coming down with, with coming down positive. 
very concerned about our kids. Uh, anybody else have questions for Janet? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, before we go away, I want to talk about two Connecticut Post articles in the last couple of days and get your take on it. They said that talked about the declining enrollment in Connecticut. I think something like 14,000 students down. And um, I think Bridgeport specifically, they talked about a lot of like missing students. So I don't know if it's kids just aren't, they're just ignoring the whole virtual or what's happening, but where would you put Strafford in, the, in that picture? Well, we don't see what uh, Bridgeport's seen. I was talking to Michael Testani, the superintendent over there, and he's um, he believes that they are just not showing up for school. They Some have, have moved out of the area and some have moved in, but those that have moved in haven't registered in Bridgeport and they're just not seeing, they don't know where those students are. Um, we've registered, well, this is an old number actually. I, uh, this was the last time I reported to the board. It was 633 new registrations in, in Stratford. Um, and to, to date, and I can't recall if this, what this number is, don't quote me on the exact number, but we have over 500 students who've moved out. So, um, and that's, we will continue to get not those numbers as the students enroll in other places and the records are, are sent for. Uh, but I think with the COVID, there are many families that are simply not sending the kids to school and not registering them. So many of those uh, new registrations have to do with all the house sales and people are moving in from, uh, primarily from New York, I guess. A lot in New York. We have a lot from New York, yes. Then another interesting article today I just saw was about uncertified coaches, a um, investigation they did. And it looked like on the map that there were two or three in Stratford that might not be certified. And do you have a way to track that? Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. We, uh, we have, we, <clears throat> our coaches have to show their certification. If they are hired and they don't have the certification, um, they, they cannot begin their coaching until that's, that's completed with the state. And we help facilitate them getting that completed, but uh, um, we don't have anyone working currently that is, as a coach, that is not certified. I remember the process when I first coached at Stratford High. I think there was an emergency, you could have a one year emergency um, right. And then you had to get the training and I went through the, the course, three credit course. So I, I punched uh -huh. a couple of names of coaches I know and like I put in one that didn't show up. And But then I put in, he was a teacher in another town and then his name showed up. And as long as you're a teacher, you're certified. Of course, they have to go through the, um, uh, let's see, the concussion First training. And, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. <clears throat> Okay, um, no, no other questions for Janet? This is uh, Laura Dancho, District 10. I just, um, I just wanted to confirm that for the sports that are running, that this, the coaches' contracts are all mailed and returned and signed and all that good stuff. All done, all done. Yeah, totally, totally finished. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess we'll go on to the MOU for school security and for flood pool. That would, um, I guess, talking about Larry Ciccarelli? Yes, that's correct. Um, How is that uh, going? I've met, I've met with Larry, and uh, matter of fact, he wanted to be on tonight, but I don't see him. Um, but met with him twice. Uh, he is, he is, start, he is um, starting to um, join all of the schools, school safety teams and attend their meetings. He's arranging our district um, a safety team, and uh, which needs to meet every quarter. Uh, so we we have we've had some very good discussions about how we will work work through some of this and training our security. So so far we're really we're doing fine. We're doing well. Thanks, and Pam, I think you were drafting a um, an MOU for the electricity usage and flood. Anything new on that? Actually, Chris Kamiak is drafting it, and I spoke to him today. He said that he currently has the draft being reviewed by the town attorney, so it should come to the board in the very near future. 
Uh, good. Thanks for the update. Any, is, uh, but, anybody, Laura, you have a question? Yeah, just, just a, a quick point. We met with Larry uh, yesterday, and he. I also just wanted to say that he's arranging uh, fire drills for the, each of the schools and also um, active shooter drills at the schools and with the the two um hi, with the hybrid he's, he's having to do that twice so if 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 it's highly likely that the schools are going to go back to full time uh classes which i think is a great decision because i agree that the students are safer in class than they are in um, two little groups right now um that would just be able to reduce the amount of I don't know, drills that he needs to to do for each of these schools, which is right. A yeah, lot. the principals the principals are very good about knowing their drills and knowing when they have to do them. But we we have had to do two each month, mm -hmm. you know, just just because they're different they're different cohorts. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Bill. Uh, Greg Hand. Go ahead, Greg. Um, thank you. I when, regarding the comment made about new students moving in and, and other students um, not re-enrolling, um, to the special ed question, um, special ed costs can go up for a number of reasons. Um, is, is the new student a primary cause this time of the escalating special ed? or the over budget special ed expense? To the best of my knowledge, I don't know what precipitated that. Um, I would have to speak with our special ed director. I believe, um, as is always the case, when we have new registrations, some of them will in fact come with IEPs and we do have to address those student needs, but I'm not really sure where the, um, the specific increase came from so it we get back to you in that okay for next time okay greg thank you all right thank you now how about the dbs consolidation as we move close to the november expiration of the contract anything good happening with that actually that was an interesting conversation because um i have a lot of uh things that i inherited that are due very soon and i was very concerned about that and phil ryan and i had a very good discussion about a week and a half ago as well as a discussion i had a couple of weeks ago with chris and basically what i learned was first of all the dbs um consolidation will not go forward i think the way that the town might have originally thought to the best of my knowledge what chris explained to me is that we are only using dbs for the management of our electricity billing so it's a minimal amount of uh, money that we pay them um, i do think it's value added i think we're a very large district and that's a lot of information to sift through um, and i know that uh, dbs has been very helpful but I guess the town had considered something along that line, and I really don't know what the town is doing with electricity. Um, but I know that they were going out for a company to represent them for their solar energy needs. And I believe they secured a company recently. And that company will, in fact, um, oversee projects for both the school and the town building. So I think that was the consolidation. Um, but the other good thing that I learned over the past week was that uh, we do have an electricity um, generation rate that's fixed, and that's through another company, it's um, Constellation. And I believe that some of the confusion was that that particular um, fixed rate agreement was going to expire in November. Bill did check on that and the town and the Board of Ed are both participating in that and we are firm with our fixed pricing through November 2023 and I'm happy to say it's at a very good rate. We did um, compare some of the uh, locations and meters and a couple of the Board of Ed ones were missing so Phil is helping us get those on the agreement as well so I think we're in pretty good shape. Oh, Good audit. And just occurred to me, are we uh, getting some savings with the Wednesday, uh, no students on Wednesdays, energy savings? 
but don't answer that just rhetorical question <laughs> yeah we're always we're always looking at that <laughs> Uh, let's see. Um, is Alan Llewellyn with us tonight? I thought I saw him earlier, but I guess not. Anybody know what's the latest on the Stratford Highway renovation project? Um, aside from the woman that crashed through the fence on King Street Saturday. Oh, you knew about that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the well, and what's that? What's that? And the, the issues in the new gym area, the leaks, and the uh, I saw a picture of a basketball backboard that was shattered. I'm not sure. Don't, don't know about that. No. It was not that was not brought up in our last uh, uh, renovation meeting. So not not sure what that that's all about. Yeah, that just happened in the past week too. We're not sure. What happened? Okay. Basketball teams aren't scrimmaging yet, are they? No, they're, they're scheduled to begin scrimmage November 7th. Okay. Any word on the turf field uh, in terms of its flatness, let's say? Oh, the crown? Mm -hmm. The crown. Thank you, Bill. Is it within 2% or we don't know yet? I think we, we're waiting. Yeah, that was a big item of discussion at the last meeting, but I, it, we're still waiting to learn some more information on that. All right. Okay, I guess let's go on to the next item, the uh, search committee. Laura, you had some questions on that? Um, I, I do. I, I just want to congratulate Dr. Robinson on her decision to retire. So... Um, that's exciting. A big, big decision. Thank you. We're very happy Thank for you. you. Let me, uh, uh, let me just throw in there. I highly recommend it. I'm enjoying myself and playing a lot of golf. <laughs> I'm be jealous of both of you. So, <laughs> um, I just good, have, <laughs> I just um, have some questions. I guess more for the board um, mm -hmm. as far as the plan for moving on with our new superintendent process and if there's a procedure for that and if so what that procedure <laughs> is um, if you're up for um, suggestions or how it's been done in the past I just want to be really clear this is an important time and um, there's a lot of things going on and I want to make sure that it's as transparent as possible we get the best candidates as possible and um, that it, it runs smoothly so I'm happy to speak to that first, Laura. Um, so we tomorrow night and next Thursday, we have meetings set up with CES and CABE um, as possible recruiting firms to help us do our superintendent search. Um, I just was communicating with Teresa today about how tomorrow night will go. So this is gonna be new for Karen and Amy listening actually, um, cause it hasn't been communicated to board members yet. But, um, and I'm gonna read actually from the email. Um, the committee is going to consist of the seven board members. The search firms have moved to this model with no outside members due to past experiences with breach of confidentiality. And it's going to be imperative that the information shared with the search committee remains confidential due to many factors. Um, and for the record, our attorney Floyd Dugas, um, this was his advice to, to do it this way as well. So not only do the firms um, uh, advise us to only have the seven board members, but our attorney does as well. So we'll start tomorrow's meeting with establishing that search committee, and then essentially we'll interview um, different firms and go with the one we feel most comfortable with to help us with our search. So we're going to start with CES and CABE, um, and then kind of take it from there and see how we feel about those two options, and then Dr. Robinson has, a, has many more um, if how, depending on how we feel from that point. Okay, so I have I have some questions. How will the position be advertised? Where will it be advertised? To be honest, Laura, besides that, I really don't know. Tomorrow night, um, we were told that we'll be getting all of that information on process and you know how we how we would go about finding candidates. I'm sure Dr. Robinson could speak to just the general process. Um, that, that people go through these 
that they essentially search out candidates, correct, Janet? Yes, that's correct. Um, Laura, the, the board will make, can decide to direct this as a national search, or they wanted a New England search, or they wanted a state search. That, that will be up to the board uh, to decide. Um, most of the recruiters will uh, talk to them about the national search and what that might look like mm -hmm. and uh, to, how to get the best the best candidates and attract them. So um, the two the two that are coming in in the next two weeks are very reputable. They they are very good at recruiting candidates. And uh, I think that probably one of them will be chosen by the board. But if not, there's mm -hmm. there are other firms, too. OK. Yeah, um, so I just wanted to um, make sure that, I, I guess my question is what kind of documents you're gonna be requesting for each applicant as they come in. And then um, personally, I think that having all seven on the board is a large search committee and maybe you should consider doing fewer and then having the fewer search committee kind of vet the incoming applicants maybe get it down to a short list and then submit the short list to the rest of the board, maybe a more um, organized way to do it. Um, this way you're not wasting a lot of time on candidates that maybe you're not interested in or may not be as qualified as you would like. The other thing that I would recommend is asking each applicant in addition to whatever, I'm assuming you're gonna ask for a CV or some sort of a resume, three letters of recommendation. I would also request that you consider they they submit maybe a one page statement of administrative policy just so that it would be a good way for you to look and see how this person might work with the rest of our town and then um kind of vet out the applicant i'm not sure how many you think you're going to get or what kind of a search uh you know how many applicants a search like this would generate but i'm used to running searches that get close to 100 applicants so um maybe you're only going to get five i don't know but those are just things that I'm concerned about. And I think that the board maybe could consider as you go through this procedure um, to, and then maybe work with the liaison committee who might be interested in meeting some of the candidates prior to making any kind of a final choice. Uh, personally, I'm interested to hear what um, the two search firms have to say. And even hearing that today from Teresa, that it will be the seven board members, that that's how it's, um, I guess, grow, grown, right, the process, and that our attorney supports that. Um, like I said, I'm just interested in hearing more tomorrow before we Good. get any deeper. You know what I mean? So. I, will, I will tell you that all of the firms will do focus groups with community members and will meet, you know, people that, at the, that are part of the liaison committee, part of the council. They will, they will organize to get input on the qualities that that the community is looking for. Okay, that's good. I, I'd be interested. I'll, I'll probably listen in for the meeting tomorrow and see um, how it goes. Um, I just wanted to point out what my personal concerns would be, and maybe as we're going through this process, um, maybe some ways to make it a little more transparent and a little more organized, like an organized. I'm sure these are professional companies. They know what they're doing. I understand that. Um, but this is just something that I would be looking for in a, in a candidate, and I would want to know how what their administrative policy was in addition to their um, actual CV. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be um, recorded because it's going to be a non-meeting, right, Janet? So we'll open the meeting, it being recorded to the public, and then when the actual firm comes in, just as a heads up, it's not going to be posted okay. or available to the be, public. It, it so. will not be recorded, yeah. Right. Okay. Everything going forward is going to be extremely confidential. So now, Janet, maybe you can best answer this question. Are search committees normally made up of just the elected board members? Um, yes, they have gone to that in the last few years because there were several, um, including Westport, several districts that lost candidates because of the lack of confidentiality. Um, so they've they've narrowed the scope because when um, it used to be that other community members or past board members might be invited to be on it, uh, but with the lawsuits and and so forth that have generated, they've they've had to move away from that. I mean, I agree it needs to be confidential, but it doesn't need to be a secret. 
um, there's a difference between that. So I would just like it to be transparent, also respecting the um, confidentiality of each applicant. And I think that any of the adults even on this meeting would understand that and respect that as well. I know I would, and I'm sure anybody else on the search committee that would just have to be an educated understanding that you're not gonna go and disclose confidential information. Any other questions on this topic? Okay, I guess we can move on to approving the uh, schedule for the 2021 meeting. Did everyone get that? We'll stay with the third Wednesday of every month at 6.30. Is that is that fine with everyone? Any opposed? I don't recall seeing the schedule, but it's fine with me. Yeah, I think it was attached with the agenda. I'm looking at it. See Carol? Oh. Carol? I, there isn't an agenda, there isn't a schedule yet because I'm not sure of what day's town hall is closed. So I will work around town hall. For instance, if Columbus Day next year is a Wednesday, are we going to have it? So it's always on a Monday. They always celebrate Columbus Day on a Monday. Okay. Well, I'll look yeah. at the schedule and then I'll put it together. Okay. Then we can approve it next month. Well, you can, if you approve it now, providing there's no holiday on that day, it'll be the same. Okay, so I guess that's the question. Is the third Wednesday still good for everyone at 6.30? Yeah. That's fine. Carol, you need a vote on that? I think we need a vote. Okay, you want to make the motion? Um, I motion to accept the um 2021 meeting schedule for the board of ed liaison committee we have a second second allison second all in favor aye, aye. any opposed okay passes unanimously thanks carol all right any old business new business Um, I don't think Nothing. so. And it, no other business? You know what, I think that if I can just ask Pam a quick question, I know that we already talked about the budget a lot, but I know that there's the, um, the two grants, the um, CARES grants that we just talked about for 925, and then the uh, the uh, COVID relief fund of um, 1.68 million. And um, I was just asking about the um, accounting of those and the differentiation between what each of these grants is going to be used for, and and are we dipping into these funds yet, or is is this um, still something that is in the approval stage? Um, I'll address the coronavirus relief fund grant first. It has been probably the most challenging grant application process that I have ever gone through. And part of the reason is the rules keep changing. Um, we were provided with the $1.68 million um, award. And I think it's important to that we stress that while we were given an award of that amount, it's really a fact that the Stratford Public Schools is eligible to receive up to 1.7 million in reverse in reimbursements mm -hmm. on COVID related expenses through December 30th only. And just, um, I'll be as brief as possible because this has gotten so complicated, but when we first submitted a very informal survey that came back in July about what we thought our costs would be related to reopening, we put in full year costs. We were very fortunate that we did put in as an aggressive amount as we did because that's why we received what we received. 
However, no one, including the State Department of Education at that time, was aware that this funding would be for expenses only through December 30th. Mm -hmm. We have really been struggling. I've been on numerous state conferences. Um, we've worked with the representatives of OPM and um, the Department of Education to clarify what's an allowable expense. And the actual application was due October 7th, which we did submit. And then last Friday, they changed the rules again. So now we have a revision that is due by this Friday, and we've been working on it. I share that with you because we are really struggling at this point to be very careful how we utilize these funds because they were very specific buckets that we were not allowed to request transfers or reallocate. However, as of this new change that's due on Friday, we can now reallocate funding that we had in transportation to other accounts, but that is the only area. So just a little bit of an understanding that we were careful what we committed to, because if there was anything that we now committed to that was a year, school year long expense, we would have to find a way to fund that from January through June. Mm -hmm. So when we realized that we had to try to refigure how we were going to make the most of the funding. Um, a lot of it for personnel is going into um, helping uh, special education get caught up with a lot of needs as well as support our students. We're doing a lot of student support type activities over the next few months. Um, and we are reallocating some of the transportation money because when we first had submitted this um, survey, we did think that we were going to do bus monitors, which turned out to not be possible. We could not even get people to accept this, those jobs, and we were only going to do it for the first few weeks. Um, but it was also logistically very challenging when we were dealing with the bus company. And we were also thought at the time, because we weren't committed to the hybrid schedule, um, of pro potentially adding um, some runs. And right now we did add two vans for our special ed students. We can't even get them both on the road because Durham can't get drivers. So there's, I share this with you because there's all kinds of struggles with CRF and so there is a real strong possibility that we will not be able to expend our full allocation. And the state is actually encouraging us to be very upfront about that because they want to be certain that they can repurpose those funds for other districts if necessary, because you may have read that some districts just didn't complete that survey as accurately or correctly. And um, I know, for example, we got a lot more than Danbury, which really, when you compare the two districts, probably should not have been the case. I will also share with you briefly that the GFOA has actually put out a survey um, on this entire CRF uh, issue nationally. And while we are all, and I can't stress this enough, extremely grateful that we are being supported by both the state um, and federally with the CRF monies, they have put some restrictions that have made it very difficult. So I share that part with you first, because once we finalize and we feel confident that we're getting this amount of reimbursement through CRF, we now have an opportunity to revise the ESSER, the CARES ESSER grant that we talked about. That's the $924,000. we have already spent a good portion of it, and we've already drawn down on it, such as um, some areas of technology. We've done um, some areas for academics, um, and even PPE has come out of that as well. So we have already been able to draw down those funds. We have not yet been able to draw down funds for CRF because we the rules changed on us. <laughs> so that, that's it in a nutshell, and I apologize for being a little wordy, but it has gotten so complicated. So we have potentially could you lose some of that funding. Absolutely. I was actually on a, um, a national conference today um, just about education finance overall, and we did all start to discuss the same issue because nationally people are struggling with these um, restrictions. And the fact that we are only able to utilize it for expenses through December 30th really doesn't make any sense on any level. Um, you know, but if we're committing to school buses, then we're committing those extra runs all year. So um, right. it's a concern. Right. Um, okay, that's um, disheartening. 
But thank you for that. Okay. Well, I don't envy any of you with what you're dealing with. Even Allison, I'm thinking you're, you're an educator yourself, right? And you have to worry about virtual for your daughter. How do you do it? Uh, we get by, Bill. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's tough. It's and then tough. Janet having to deal with all this for your final, what, how many months, eight more months or whatever? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the inter is interesting statistic I heard today on a national conference. Um, this is the highest already, beginning of the year, this is the highest rate of superintendents retiring they've seen in decades. <laughs> So well, if I were you, I'd retire right now and say, good luck. I'm going to go play golf. <laughs> <laughs> Almost every profession. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 um, it's a trying year. It's mm. very trying. Mm. But, um, but I'll tell you, we've got some really, really good people in the district. Um, that's all I can say. They're wonderful. So I, we have to support them as best we can. Uh, I, I have to, of course, you know who I know very closely and dearly, and I know what, what she does seven days a week, all hours of days and night. And incredible. Yeah. But um, thanks all for a meeting under an hour. That was very good. If we can have a yeah. motion to adjourn. I'll do that, Laura Dancho. Motion to adjourn. Second. Bill Perillo, are you here tonight? Bill. I'll second Alice and Del Benny. I was on mute. Sorry, I'll second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody Aye. opposed? Okay, pass unanimously. Meeting adjourned at 727. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Take care.